Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 68. Let us sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Saviour, who daily bears our burdens. First hymn reminds us that regardless of the distance between us as humanity and God, the divine, that we are in the presence of God the King and we can praise Him. So let's stand together as we sing.
chance to introduce the My Story section in our service. And we've invited um, members of our community who we're connected to, not necessarily on a Sunday in our worshipping space, but broader in how we engage with community. And one of those main connections is between Unity College and ourselves. And so this morning, Dan Shea's here to share with us. So Dan, most of you will know, is the principal at Unity College. And so Dan, I'd like to come and, and share with us this morning. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pastor Stephen. Can I say a very good morning to all of you? It's such a, an honour to be with you this morning and to have the opportunity to share a little bit about my story. And can I say, without exception, that every time I've ever been here, I've felt so welcome. And that really is a credit um, to all of you and, and to this community. Again, thanks for having me today. I was thinking about what I would share with you. Um, over the last couple of days and, and, and I was recalling being a young teenager and my family were Catholics and, and being going to church on Sunday was a non-negotiable in my house and, and for, my, for my grandparents as well, all four of them would have expected that. Um, but there were a few years there where I may not have gone very regularly and, um, and Perhaps you've experienced this as well with some of your family, but what my dad did it drove me crazy. Um, he would take the church bulletin um, home from, from church and he would just leave it on my pillow. <laughs> and he, knew, he never said a word about it, but I'd come and find this thing on my pillow and I'd be angry and full of guilt and yeah, ultimately I think that's worked. So perhaps you want to try that um, if you've got some young, younger people that you feel should be here. Um, Pastor Stephen mentioned I'm the principal of Unity College. Um, I, I'm a father of, of three children. One of my, one of my um, youngest child, Max, is with me here today. I grew up in, I grew up in Scarborough on the Redcliffe Peninsula and I went, to, I went to school down there as well. Um, and my faith was always... Uh, part of my life, but not so explicitly, um, I guess. And it wasn't actually until I was about 19, despite always being in a, in a, in a Christian family and going to a school that was a faith-based school, it was only when I was about 19, actually, that it, the penny dropped for me that Jesus is, is real, is alive, is here and now, and that, and that is about freedom, and that's about living full, living life to the full. And, and when that penny dropped for me, it really um, changed my path in a different direction. Because in fact, I'd never considered being a school teacher. It, it wouldn't have been in my top twenty possible uh, professions, actually. And I was on a different path, and I actually did a year of, of volunteer. Um, youth ministry work, travelling around Australia. And it was during that time that I decided that perhaps I, I wouldn't be a bad teacher. And, and, and that's really led me where, where I am today. A, a sense of vocation driven by that belief and a desire to share that hope um, and share that, that faith story in a relatable way to the people that I encounter. I've, I've been a teacher now for 20 something years and um, I've had the privilege of being the principal of Unity College for the last five years. And that's been an incredible journey. And, um, and there's so many familiar faces here that have been a great part of the Unity story. A dream for an ecumenical school in partnership with multiple churches. And we know that um, John Dobson, Father John Dobson, who would come and speak in your church regularly, and Brian Gilbert and the Morrisons and, and others who were instrumental in um, the formation of a school, which is now 18 years old. And, and like, a, like a, a teenager, an 18 year old, it's um, fully grown, mostly, um, and maybe still in some ways working out its identity a little, but what's held true is that the, the partnership um, the ecumenical partnership between the Catholic and the Uniting Church in Unity College is something that is incredibly valued and important. 
and, and it's led us to have many questions and conversations and we have to come to that without being precious. Because when we do, and when we are fully in dialogue, we actually um, understand our own faith better by respecting and knowing the other. So what that means at our school is we teach, honour, celebrate both of those traditions in our school. And we would hope that our students um, know them and experience them and know the difference. When I was um, interviewed, but Eamon uh, Dunn was actually on the interview panel when I was interviewed for the position at, at Unity College and I was, I, was, I was grilled, I think, grilled actually about uh, how, I would, how we would um, navigate this ecumenical space. And I think, I think what I said is, is what I've been trying to do. And I think what I said is that I wouldn't be changing my religion but I would hope that I would be visible and present and helpful and have great relationships with both of those faith partners. And, and that's, that's happening, you know, I think. And, and I've had incredible friendships with um, many of you in the room, particularly Amy and Brian, the Morrisons, and, um, and we're extremely grateful for them. And we're at a time where um, we've just received Pastor Stephen to our community, and it's a new time. And we're excited about the renewing and the strengthening of, of that relationship and this partnership in our context. And Pastor Stevens already um, been at our school and at our board meeting and was very well received on our Mother's Day assembly just last week. So I'd like to say that we are excited about, about this next um, chapter in the journey. and um, and. It's something that we really are committed to and is an incredibly valuable part of our school and our, and our story. And I would love to invite your community to come and, and visit our, our school and to show you our chapel and, and, and some of the spaces in our college. And I'll be working with Pastor Stephen to arrange a time if that may be possible. I want to finish by just presenting something. I might get my little assistant to come up here, if that's okay, Max. Um, this is a part of a, come on mate, um, this is a, a gift that I'd like to leave with, with you today and perhaps there's a, a space that they could fit in, in your church or in an office, but this is part of a beautiful mural that we had installed at, at our school last year and um, the, the common ground when Unity was being formed was this Celtic Christian um, spirituality with virtues of awe and wonder, respect for nature, prayer and contemplation, welcome and hospitality, and circle of God's unending love. And that's the virtues that we want to see lived in our school. And we had this project commissioned and this, this wall of awe and wonder. And this part of it is, um, as you can see, the Unity Celtic Cross and the pelican. And the pelican story of sacrificial love. The Jesus story is um, present in that pelican in our Celtic cross and throughout many of the artworks in our school. So I'd love to leave that with you today. And again, um, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. God bless you. Sometimes they go well, and sometimes they go 
Not so well, so I've got a little bit of a display here. Now you think, <laughs> you already know what's going to happen. I've got a pin. What happens when I put a pin in this balloon? It'll pop. Who wants to have a go? Okay, <laughs> do it on your pink one. Hold it high. Hold, maybe hold it by this button here, and then see what happens. Hold it away from you. What's going to happen? <laughs> Now, over here, I've got a hole. Can you pass me that other pin? But when this one pin becomes a part of other pins, and it becomes part of a one group of people, what happens now? We've got a lot of pins. What's going to happen with this? Are they all going to, is this going to pop as well? No. Why? Why do you think it won't pop? Because the area of tension, oh, you've been listening to the science, is good. <laughs> so the, there's some, it is going to be shared evenly across the surface of the balloon. So let's have a try. There's about six or seven here. I'm pushing down on all those pins. It's not popping. So sometimes when the burden of life is too challenging, we do things on our own, our lives become more difficult and they might pop. But when we join together as one group, things become a little bit more bearable. We can do things better. And in this prayer that we're going to hear in our Bibles uh, reading after you've gone into your, uh, your lesson, tells us that Jesus is praying to God and he's asking for unity between all of his people and he's telling his disciples that they need to be together as one so that they can show Christ and God's relationship with the Holy Spirit together as one. And so as you go back in your lives and this week, maybe think how you might want to be together with others, how you might be better in serving God and showing God's unity in that space. So if you want to go to your lesson, thanks for your help. There's um, a little bit of a theme of unity today. It worked well that Dan could come this morning. We're going to sing our next hymn. And this song is about renewing our minds and our souls um, from the power of God's love in our lives. And so as we sing, let's embrace this healing story in our life.
Abba, Father, your, sin, your son said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. But Father, we gather here this morning as your disciples. We ask you to bless us all, even those who support the dolphins. <laughs> You know our joys, you know our worries, and you know our stresses. But we should know that you are walking beside us in each moment of our lives. But we in turn are your hands, your feet, and your actions to whom we meet and proclaim your word to. Abba Father, in our greater Calandra community, we recognize the many good things this community brings to its peoples. The dedication of so many who volunteer in our community. We recognize the goodness in so many. But we also recognize the angst many have in their daily lives. Lives also often dealing with the struggles of daily living being homeless, being abandoned, living with the fear of domestic violence, the fear of not meeting our family's needs. But we are your hands, your feet, your actions, in whom we meet, proclaim, and live your word to. Abba Father, we pray that the word yes and no will not divide our nation. We pray for the acceptance of this important time ahead, that the minds of the many will make clear decisions. As your disciples, we are your hands, your feet and your actions in whom we meet, proclaim, and live your word too. Abba Father, the view of the world from space is one of tranquil motion. Yet in this world, on a daily basis, we have hunger, war, and suffering. It is at times overpowering. It would seem that at times we, whom you sent your son to, have not learned much in the intervening 2,000 years. Yet, as your disciples, we are your hands, your feet, your actions, in whom we meet, proclaim, and live your word too. Let us pray the shortened version of St. Patrick's breastplate prayer. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every ear, in every eye that sees me, and Christ in every ear that hears me. Amen. The New Testament reading today is from Acts chapter 6, verses 6 to 14. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Matthias chosen to replace Judas. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, <laughs> and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All of these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The Gospel reading is from John 17, verses 1 to 11. Jesus prays for his disciples. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so they may be one as we are one. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And it's the fourth Sunday exploring Jesus' teachings about faith, discipleship, and living in intimacy with God. And this morning we're going to look at prayer. Both of our Bible readings focus on prayer. And when we consider the world today, Amen alluded to it in his prayers, the world is rife with pain and illness and suffering, death and disease and injustice 
and it's hard for us to see where prayer plays a role in it. Does God routinely intervene and get involved in human lives? Does God's intervention, or lack thereof, depend on the way that we ask God, how we come before Him? Can prayer change God's mind? Can prayer change circumstances? Can prayer change us? Of course we can believe this, but we can never truly know. And the answer to these questions is purely part of our belief. But we do know that Jesus prayed, and Jesus asked. Jesus humbly came before God and sought communion with him. On this last Sunday of Easter, we are invited to engage with Jesus as he makes this high priestly prayer to his Father. The setting is significant for this significant prayer is in the upper room on what we would now call Monday Thursday. The atmosphere in the room is heavy, it's poignant, it's sad. Jesus had just said his goodbyes to his disciples. Every word he has said, every teaching that they have received, every miraculous deed and supernatural gesture that they have seen is now weighted with their own grief. Jesus has washed their feet, he's fed them with bread and with wine, he has promised them the Holy Spirit, and he has commanded them to love one another. In this moment, Jesus has spoken to his followers with a sense of tenderness and yet also of urgency, because he knows that the time for him to leave is imminent. In the moments before he was arrested, Jesus looks up to the skies and he shares his deepest heartfelt desires to God. He begins to pray for himself, but in praying for himself, he's also praying for his disciples. He's praying for us. I'm asking, Jesus says, I'm asking on their behalf. This prayer is sometimes referred to as the other Lord's Prayer. This one, however, isn't so poetic. It doesn't flow, it's somewhat long and it's rambling. And it's a bit of a challenge to follow. Well done, Pat, for, for getting through there. It certainly isn't memorised and recited on Sunday mornings at church. Jesus here is coming before God with his burden. He understands that this burden is God's glory and that it will be realised and finished by the works on the cross. Jesus has every right to ask in this moment of challenge and stress and sadness for help which is much needed in the glorification of his name. This prayer begins with a petition, as does the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name. And in the same way, this is the first emphasis in this prayer. Jesus' tone is one of urgency and passion. And even though the prayer is voiced in the presence of his disciples, the prayer is achingly private. Jesus isn't merely using this as a moment to teach his followers, he's actually pouring out his heart to God. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, has written many wonderful books, one of which is called Tokens of Trust. It describes the strangeness and the wonder of Jesus who prays. Williams writes, Yes, Jesus is a human being in whom God's action is at work without interruption or impediment. But wait a moment, Jesus, the Jesus we meet in the Gospels is someone who prays, who seeks of putting his will and his decisions on the one he prays to as Father. In him there is divine purpose, power and action, but there is also humility, responsiveness and reciprocity. Jesus spends his final hours on the earth in a humble, vulnerable supplication to God. He ends his ministry asking, uncertain of the answer, hoping but doubtful, trusting into the danger. Jesus shows through asking this last act of love for his disciples who are gathered at the table with him. This is the last tender moment between them, the last gesture of hope he extends to his faithful followers. It definitely would have been a better finale if Jesus had finished with an awe-inspiring show of his might with a miracle, or humbled them with an example of his divine power. 
but rather he looks up to heaven with a trembling heart and surrenders his beloved friends to God. Jesus is asking, he's requesting, he's hoping, not knowing what God will do with the requests, not knowing how or when or even if the prayer will be answered. Jesus knows he can't force the hand of God, but he is staking his life and the life of those that he loves on the goodness of God, because that is all that he has in that last moment. There's nothing more. He is asking. Prayer isn't always easy. There seems to be so many questions that we have around prayer, especially when we are going through the mill of life, when all the difficulties are upon us. It's okay to have these questions. It's okay to think, is that really the case for me? But even in the midst of our questioning, it is important for us to remember that Jesus spent his last hours teaching us what it looks like to have a meaningful and heartfelt conversation with God. Perhaps while Jesus is teaching us here is that when all else seems to have ended, when everything has eroded away, prayer is constant. Prayer remains. Even in our darkest moments, when we feel as if we have hit rock bottom, prayer offers us that solid rock, that foundation to rebuild the links between ourselves and the divine between us and God. Our questions through prayer are met with God's promises, which never fail. Our longings are met with God's grace and that is always true. Prayer offers us a way forward into life of renewed hope, of strength, of meaning, life of possibility. It's also worth considering at this point what the content of this high priestly prayer was. What was Jesus asking for? And in short, the list is quite long. However, one of the requests stands out from the others. And whilst we have tried and continue to try to move in this way, this request has yet to be answered. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. That they may be one. Earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus commands the disciples to love one another so that everyone will know that they are followers of Christ. On this night before his death, Jesus declares the love and unity of his disciples as a litmus test for the Christian faith and witness. Our ability to love one another is our difference. Our willingness, our willingness to not only engage but to cherish and to preserve our God-ordained oneness is precisely the way that the world will see and know who we are and whose we are. Our love for each other is how the world will see, hear, taste, touch and find Jesus. It's through our unity that we will embody Jesus. It is in this unity that we make Jesus relatable. It is in the unity that Jesus becomes possible and plausible and accessible to a dying world. Our basis of union in the United Church in its inception was called, the church was called to be in relationship with people and to be on a pilgrim journey, a pilgrim people on a journey together. And whilst we strive for this, oftentimes we have been found lacking. Right now, throughout our denomination, there are signs of disunity everywhere. And this is true across the entirety of the Christian church as a whole. In Caloundra alone, there are 169 churches, which is really good for church shopping but not so good for honouring the call to unity with God. 169 churches. What Jesus seems to be saying in this prayer is that if we fail to reconcile our differences and unify, if we normalise uh, divisiveness, separation, bitterness and discord, the world will never know what it needs to know about God and the triune God as one. And in its absence, of this knowledge, falsehoods about the kingdom of God start to materialise, which breaks God's heart. If the knowledge of the kingdom values is not known to the world, then Jesus' revolution is seen as a sham. The world will assume that there is really no transformative power in the resurrection story of Christ. 
if we revert to the understanding of a mean God, angry and vindictive, looking only for ways to punish his children. We lead, uh, which leads to a belief that the universe is cold, meaningless, a place devoid of love. The world will write off the church as a broken, corrupted, hypocritical institution rather than Christ's living, breathing, serving body here on earth. Our decision to love Jesus or not has power. Our choice to be one or to be divided has power. As followers of Christ Jesus, we have chosen to respond to his prayer, to his hope, to his commandments. However, oftentimes we find ourselves complacently engaging in this disunity, clinging to our tradition, to the ways that we live, rather than being together as one. Jesus spent his last night serving his friends, pleading for unity between them, praying for church, praying for the church, that it would be one as he was one with the Father, not uniform, but rather unified, determined to love, to reconcile, to bless, and to bring people together across all the barriers that humanity has erected. It's been thousands of years since Jesus prayed this prayer of unity, and perhaps this should be our prayer also for the unification of God's people. We see elements of this within our own faith congregation here in Caladra, our links between the Catholic parish and Unity College, connections with the Anglicans and the Salvos in our work in the community efforts to serve the loss of those who are less fortunate to us, our work with um, Gateway Care, another link to community. But perhaps there could be more. Perhaps we could be find ways to be more unified. Perhaps as we engage in prayer, we might realign our desires with those of Christ Jesus and ask God for an end to this complacency, hopelessness and defeat, that they may be one, remains God's cherished desire for us may become our desire as well. Shall we pray? <coughs> Mighty God, we, we thank you for the example that you have shown in our lives. We thank you for Jesus, for his desire to teach us the way to be one. Lord, as we continue to serve you, as we continue to journey in this life, Lord, we ask that you bring before us others who might help us be in unity with you. Help us put aside our own passions and let us see your passion for this world. Help us to be unified so that we can show in this dark world your light, your truth and your love. Amen.
Christ you taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show you steadfast love through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for blessing in this world. Creator God, you made all things in your wisdom, and in your love you save us. We pray for the whole of creation, overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong, feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice, so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made, and joyfully sing your praises. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the blessing on the church. Gracious God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to the world, that all may believe you are love. Turn to your ways and live in the light of your truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for a blessing on our world. Eternal Ruler, hope of all the earth, you sent us a Saviour, Jesus Christ, to break down walls of hostility and that divide us. Send peace on earth and put down greed, pride and anger, which turn nations against nation, race against race. Speed the day when all wars will end and the whole world accepts your rule of love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for blessing on the sick and those who are grieving. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick and bring healing as a sign of your grace. Stand with those who are in sorrow, that they may know your comfort through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Almighty God, your blessed Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Mercifully give us faith to trust that as he promised, he abides with us here on earth for all time. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning uh, is another Charles Wesley classic. We've had a couple this morning, but there's been some smiles about that, so that's good. It's often reserved for weddings, um, but the, this is really a prayer asking Jesus to abide in us, to set us free from those things that keep us from God's love and life in all its fullness. And so as we sing this morning, let's join together and claim God's renewal for ourselves. Let's stand together as we can. Thanks.
mighty God in whom we know the power of redemption. You stand amongst us in the shadows of our time. As we move through every sorrow and trial of this life, uphold us with the knowledge of the final morning, when in the glorious presence of your risen Son, we will share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life, and forever free to be your people. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.